The story of a mother. A mother sat there with her little child. She was so downcast, so afraid that he should die. It was so pale. The small eyes had closed themselves, and he drew his breath so softly. Now and then, with a deep respiration, as if he sighed. And the mother looked still more sorrowfully on the little creature. Then a knocking was heard at the door, and in came a poor old man wrapped up as in a large horse cloth for a warm form, and he needed it as it was the cold winter season. Everything out of doors was covered with ice and snow. And the wind blew so that it cut the face. As the old man trembled with cold, and the little child slept a moment, the mother went and poured some ale into a pot and set it on the stove, that it might be warm for him. The old man sat and rocked the cradle, and mother sat down on a chair close by him. And looked at her little sick child that drew its breath so deep, and raised its little hand. Do you not think that I shall save him? Said she. Our Lord will not take him from me. And the old man, it was Death himself. He nodded so strangely. It could just as well signify yes as no. And the mother looked down in her lap, and the tears ran down over her cheeks. Her head became so heavy; she had not closed her eyes for three days and nights. And now she slept, but only for a minute. She started up and trembled with cold. "What is that?" said she. And looked on all sides, but the old man was gone, and her little child was gone. He had taken it with him, and the old clock in the corner burned and burned. The great linen rate ran down to the floor, bump, and then the clock also stood still. But the poor mother ran out of the house. And cried aloud for a child. Out there, in the midst of the snow, there sat a woman in long black clothes, and she said, "Death has been in thy chamber, and I saw him hasten away with thy little child. He goes faster than the wind, and he never brings back what he takes." Oh. Only tell me which way he went," said the mother. "Tell me the way, and I shall find him." "I know it," said the woman in the black clothes. "But before I tell thee, thou must first sing for me all the songs thou hast sung for thy child. I am fond of them. I have heard them before. I am night." I saw thy tears whistle. Thou sings them. I will sing them all, all," said the mother. "But do not stop me now. I may overtake him. I may find my child." But night stood still and mute. Then the mother warmed her hands, sang and wept. And there were many songs, but yet many more tears. And then night said, "Go to the right, into the dark pine forest. Thither I saw death take his way with thy little child." The rods crossed each other in the depths of the forest, and she no longer knew whether she should go. Then there stood a thorn bush, 
there was neither leaf nor flower on it. It was also in the cold winter season, and ice flakes hung on the branches. Hast thou not seen death go past with my little child? said the mother. Yes, said the thorn bush, but I will not tell thee which way he took, unless thou wilt first warm me up at thy heart. I am freezing to death. I shall become a lump of ice. And she pressed the thorn bush to her breast so firmly that it might be thoroughly warmed, and the thorns went right into her flesh, and her blood flowed in large drops. But the thorn bush shot forth fresh green leaves, and there came flowers on it in the cold winter night. The heart of the afflicted mother was so warm, and the thorn bush told her the way she should go. She then came to a large lake, where there was neither sheep nor boat. The lake was not frozen sufficiently to bear her, neither was it open, nor low enough that she could wade through it. And across it, she must go if she would find her child. Then she lay down to drink up the lake, and that was an impossibility for a human being. But the afflicted mother thought that a miracle might happen, nevertheless. Oh, what do I not give to my to come to my child? said the weeping mother, and she wept still more, and her eyes sunk down in the depths of the waters, and became two precious pearls. But the water bore her up, as if she sat in a swing, and she flew in the rocking waves to the shore on the opposite side, where there stood a mile broad strange house. One knew not if it were a mountain with forests and caverns, or if it were built up. But the poor mother could not see it. She had to weep her eyes out. There shall I find death, who took away my little child, said she. He has not come here yet, said the old grave woman. Who was appointed to look after Death's great greenhouse? How have you been able to find the way here? And who has helped you? Our Lord has helped me," said she. "He is merciful, and you will also be so. Where shall I find my little child? Nay, I know not," said the woman. And you cannot see. Many flowers and trees have withered this night. Death will soon come and plant them over again. You certainly know that every person has his or her life's tree or flower, just as everyone happens to be settled. They look like other plants, but they have pulsations of the heart. Children's hearts can also beat. Go after yours. Perhaps you may know your child's. But what will you give me if I tell you what you shall do more? I have nothing to give," said the afflicted mother. "But I will go to the world's end for you." "Nay, I have nothing to do there," said the woman. "But you can give me your long black hair." You know yourself that it is fine, and that I like. You shall have my white hair instead, and that's always something. Do you demand nothing else? Says she. That I will gladly give you. And she gave her her fine black hair, and got the old woman's snow white hair instead. 
So they went into Death's great greenhouse, where flowers and trees grew strangely into one another. There stood fine hyacinth under glass bells, and there stood strong stemmed peonies. There grew water plants, some so fresh, others half sick. The water snakes lay down on them, and black crabs pinched their stalks. There stood beautiful palm trees, ox, and plantains. There stood parsley and flowering thyme. Every tree and every flower had its name. Each of them was a human life. The human frame still lived one in China, and another in Greenland, round about in the world. There were large trees in small pots, so that they stood stunted in growth, and ready to burst the spot. In other places, there was a little dull flower in rich mold. With moss round among it, and it was so petted and nursed. But the distressed mother bent down over all the smallest plants, and heard within them how the human heart beat. And amongst millions, she knew her child's. There it is, cried she, and stretched her hands out over a little blue crocus. They hung quite sickly on one side. Don't touch the flower," said the old woman. "But place yourself here, and when death comes, I expect him every moment. Do not let him pluck the flower up, but threaten him that you will do the same with the others. Then he will be afraid." He is responsible for them to our Lord, and no one dares to pluck them up before He gives leave. All at once, an icy cold rushed through the great hall, and the blind woman could feel that it was death that came. How hast thou been able to find thy way there? He asked. How couldst thou come quicker than I? I am a mother," said she, and Death stretched out his long hand towards the fine little flower, but she held her hands fast around his, so tight, and yet afraid that she should touch one of the leaves. Then Death blew on her hands, and she felt that it was. Colder than the cold wind, and her hands fell down powerless. Thou canst not do anything against me," said Death. "But our Lord can," said she. "I only do His bidding," said Death. "I am His gardener. I take all His flowers and trees." And plant them out in the great garden of paradise, in the unknown land. But how they grow there, and how it is there, I dare not tell thee. Give me back my child," said the mother, and she wept and prayed. At once she seized hold of two beautiful flowers close by, with each hand. And cried out to Death, "I will tear all thy flowers off, for I am in despair." "Toss them not," said Death. "Thou sayest that thou art so unhappy, and now thou wilt make another mother equally unhappy." "Another mother," said the poor woman. And directly let go her out of both flowers. There, thou hast thine eyes," said Death. "I finished them up from the lake. They shone so bright. I knew not they were thine. Take them again. 
They are now brighter than before. Now look down into the deep well close by. I shall tell thee the names of the two flowers thou wouldn't have torn up. And thou wilt see their whole future life, their whole human existence, and see what thou was about to disturb and destroy. And she looked down into the wall, and it was a happiness to see how the one became a blessing to the world, to see how much happiness and joy were felt everywhere. And she saw the other's life, and it was sorrow and distress, horror and wretchedness. Both of them are God's will, said Death. Which of them is misfortune's flower, and which is that of happiness? asked she. Then I will not tell thee, said Death, but this thou shalt know from me that the one flower was thy own child, it was thy child's fate, thou sawest thy own child's future life. Then the mother screamed with terror, which of them was my child, telling me, save the innocent, save my child from all the misery, rather take it away take it into God's kingdom, forget my tears, forget my prayers, and all that I have done. I do not understand thee, said Death. Will thou have thy child again, or shall I go with it there where thou dost not know? Then the mother wrung her hands, fell on her knees, and prayed to our Lord, Oh, hear me not when I pray against thy will, which is the best. Hear me not, hear me not. And she bowed her head down in her lap, and Death took her child and went with it into the unknown land. The Happy Family Really, the largest green leaf in this country is a dog leaf. If one holds it before one, it is like a whole apron. And if one holds it over one's head in rainy weather, it is almost as good as an umbrella, for it is so immensely large. The bird dog never grows alone, but where there grows one, there always grow several. It is a great delight, and all this delightfulness is snail's food. The great white snails which persons of quality in former times made fricasses of eight and said, Ham, ham. How delicious, for they thought it tasted so delicate leaved on dock leaves, and therefore Bardoxy's were song. Now there was an old manor house where they no longer ate snails, they were quite extinct, but the Bardocks were not extinct. They grew and grew all over the walls and all the beds. They could not get the mastery over them. It was a whole forest of burdocks. Here and there stood an apple and a plum tree, or else one never would have thought that it was a garden. All was burdocks and there lived the two last vulnerable old snails. They themselves knew not how old they were, 
but they could remember very well that there had been many more. The they were of a family from foreign lands, and that for them and theirs the whole forest was planted. They had never been outside it, but they knew that there was still something more in the world, which was called the Menor House, and that there they were boiled, and then they became black. And were then placed on a silver disc. But what happened further they knew not, or in fact, what it was to be boiled and to lie on a silver dish, they could not possibly imagine. But it was said to be delightful and particularly genteel. Neither the shepherds, the taws, nor the earthworms whom they asked about it could give them any information. None of them had been boiled or laid on a silver dish. The old white snails were the first persons of distinction in the world, did they knew. The forest was planted for their sake, and the manor house was there that they might be boiled and laid on a silver dish. Now they lived a very lonely and happy life. And as they had no children themselves, they had adopted a little common snail, which they brought up as their own. But the little one would not grow, for he was of a common family. But the old ones, especially Dame Mother Snail, thought they could absorb how he increased in size, and she begged father, if he could not see, that he would at least fill the little snail's shell. And then he felt it, and found the good dame was right. One day, there was a heavy storm of rain. Hear how it beats like a drum on the dark leaves," said Father Snail. "There are also raindrops," said Mother Snail. And now the rain pours right down the stalk. You will see that it will be wet here. I am very happy to think that we have our good house, and the little one has his also. There is more done for them than for all other creatures, sure enough. But can you not see that we are a fox of quantity in the world? We are provided with a house from our birth, and the burdock forest is planted for our sakes. I should like to know how far it extends and what there is outside. There is nothing at all," said Father Snail. "No place can be better than ours, and I have nothing to wish for." "Yes," said the dame. "I would willingly go to the manor house, be boiled, and laid on a silver dish. All our forefathers have been treated so. There is something extraordinary in it." You may be sure the manor house has most likely fallen to ruin," said Father Snail. "Or the burdocks have grown up over it, so that they cannot come out. There need not, however, be any haste about that. But you are always in such a tremendous hurry." And the little one is beginning to be the same. Has it not been creeping up the stalk these three days? It gives me a headache when I look up to him. You must not scold him," said Mother Snail. He creeps so carefully. He will afford us much pleasure, and we have nothing but him to live for. But have you not thought of it? Where shall we get a wife for him? 
do you not think that there are some of our species at a great distance in the interior of the Berta forest? Black snails, I dare say. There are enough of, said the old one. Black snails without a house, but they are so common and so conceited. But we might give the ants a commission to look out for us. They run to and from as if they had something to do, and they certainly know of a wife for our little snail. I know one, sure enough, the most charming one, said one of the ants, but I am afraid we shall hardly succeed, for she is a queen. That is nothing. Said the old fox, "Has she a house?" "She has a palace," said the ant, "the finest ant's palace, with seven hundred passages." "I thank you," said Mother Snail. "Our son shall not go into an ant hill. If you know nothing better than that, we shall give the commission to the white ant." They fly far and wide in rain and sunshine. They know the whole forest here, both within and without. We have a wife for him," said the gnat. At a hundred human paces from here, there sits a little snail in her house, on a gooseberry bush. She is quite lonely, and old enough to be married. It is only a hundred human paces. Well, then, let her come to him," said the old ones. "He has a whole forest of burdocks. She has only a bush." And so they went and fetched little Miss Snail. It was a whole week before she arrived. But therein was just the very best of it, for one could thus see that she was of the same species. And then the marriage was celebrated. Six earthworms shone as well as they could. In other respects, the whole went off very quietly, for the old fox could not bear noise and merriment. But old Dame Snail made a brilliant speech. Father Snail could not speak; he was too much affected. And so they gave them as a dowry and inheritance the whole forest of Burdas, and said what they had always said: that it was the best in the world, and if they lived honestly and decently. And increased and multiplied, they and their children would once in the course of time come to the manor house, be boiled black, and laid on silver dishes. After this speech was made, the old ones crept into their shells, and never more came out. They slept. The young couple governed the forest. And had a numerous province, but they were never boiled, and never came on the silver dishes. So from this, they conclude that the manor house had fallen to ruins, and that all the men in the world were extinct. And as no one contradicted them, so of course it was so. And the rain beat on the dark leaves to make drum music for their sake, and the sun shone in order to give the Barda forest a color for their sakes, and they were very happy, and the whole family was happy, for they indeed were so.
from Andersen's Fairy Tales by Hans Christian Andersen. People said the evening bell is sounding, the sun is setting, for the strange wonders toll was heard in the narrow streets of a large town. It was like the sound of a church bell, but it was only heard for a moment, for the rolling of the carriages and the voices of the multitude made too great a noise. Those persons who were walking outside the town, where the houses were farther apart, with gardens or little fields between them, could see the evening sky still better, and heard the sound of the bell much more distinctly. It was as if the tones came from a church in the still forest, People looked thither and felt their minds attuned most solemnly. A long time passed, and people said to each other, I wonder if there is a church out in the wood. The bell has a tone that is wondrous sweet. Let us stroll thither and examine the matter nearer. And the rich people drove out and the poor walked, but the way seemed strangely long to them. And when they came to a clump of willows, which grew on the skirts of the forest, they sat down and looked up at the long branches, and fancied they were now in the depths of the green wood. The confectioner of the town came out and set up his booth there, and soon after came another confectioner, who hung a bell over his stand as a sign or ornament, but it had no clapper, and it was tarred over to preserve it from the rain. When all the people returned home, they said it had been very romantic, and that it was quite a different sort of thing to a picnic or a tea party. There were three persons who asserted they had penetrated to the end of the forest, and that they had always heard the wonderful sounds of the bell, but it had seemed to them as if it had come from the town. One wrote a whole poem about it, and said the bell sounded like the voice of a mother who a good dear child and that no melody was sweeter than the tones of the bell. The king of the country was also observant of it, and vowed that he who could discover whence the sounds proceeded should have the title of universal bell ringer, even if it were not really a bell. Many persons now went to the wood for the sake of getting the place, but one only returned with a sort of explanation, for nobody went far enough, that one not further than the others. However, he said that the sound proceeded from a very large owl in a hollow tree, a sort of learned owl, that continually knocked its head against the branches. But whether the sound came from his head or from the hollow tree, then no one could say with certainty. So now he got the place of universal bell ringer and wrote eagerly a short treatise on the owl, but everybody was just as wise as before. It was the day of confirmation. The clergyman said had spoken to touchingly. The children who were confirmed had been greatly moved. It was an eventful day for them. From children they become all at once grown-up persons. It was as if their infant souls were now to fly all at once into persons with more understanding. The sun was shining gloriously. The children that had been confirmed went out of the town and from the wood was borne toward them the sounds of the unknown bell with wonderful distinctness. They all immediately felt a wish to go thither, 
all except three. One of them had to go home to try on a ball dress, for it was just a dress and the ball which had caused her to be confirmed this time, for otherwise she would not have come. The other was a poor boy who had borrowed his coat and boots to be confirmed in from the innkeeper's son, and he was to give them back by a certain hour. The third said that he never went to a strange place if his parents were not with him, that he had always been a good boy, Theodore, and would still be so now that he was confirmed, and that one out not to laugh at him for it. The others, however, did make fun of him, after all. There were three, therefore, that did not go. The others hastened known. The sunshine, the birds sang, and the children sang too, and each held the other by the hand. For as yet they had none of them any high office, and were all equal rank in the eye of God. But two of the youngest soon grew tired, and both returned to town. Two little girls sat down and twined garlands, so they did not go either. And when the others reached the willow tree where the confectioner was, they said, Now we are there. In reality, the bell does not exist. It is only a fancy that people have taken into their heads. At the same moment, the bell sounded deep in the wood, so clear and solemnly that five or six determined to penetrate somewhat further. It was so thick, and the foliage so dense, that it was quite fatiguing to proceed. Wood roof and anyone is grew almost too high. Blooming convolvulus and blackberry bushes hung in long garlands from tree to tree, where the night gale sang and the sunbeams were playing. It was very beautiful, but it was no place for girls to go. Their clothes would get so torn. Large blocks of stone lay there, overgrown with most of every color. The fresh spring bulbed forth and made a strange gurgling sound. That surely cannot be the bell, said one of the children, lying down and listening. This must be looked to, so he remained and let the others go on without him. They afterwards came to a little house made of branches and the bark of trees. A large wild apple tree bent over it, as if it would shower down all its blessings on the roof where roses were blooming. The long stems twined around the gable, on which there hung a small bell. Was it that which people had heard? Yes, everybody was unanimous on the subject except one, who said that the bell was too small and too fine to be heard, so great a distance, and besides, it was very different tones to those that could move a human heart in such a manner. It was a king's son who spoke, whereon the others said, such people always want to be wiser than everybody else. They now let him go on alone, and as he went, his breast was filled more and more with the forest solitude, but he still heard a little bell with which the others were so satisfied, and now and then, when the wind blew, he could also hear the people singing who were sitting at tea where the confectioner had his tent. But the deep sound of the bell rose louder. It was almost as if an organ were accompanying it. 
and the tones came from the left hand, the side where the heart is placed. A rustling was heard in the bushes, and the little boy stood before the king's son, a boy in wooden shoes. And with so short a jacket that one could see what long whistle he had. Both knew each other. The boy was that one among the children who could not come because he had to go home and return his jacket and boots to the innkeeper's son. This he had done and was now going on in wooden shoes and in his humble dress. For the bell sounded with so deep a tone and with such strange power that proceed he must. Why, then, we can go together, said the king's son. But the poor child that had been confirmed was quite ashamed. He looked at his wooden shoes, pulled at the short sleeves of his jacket. And said that he was afraid he could not walk so fast. Besides, he thought that the bell must be looked for to the right, for that was the place where all sorts of beautiful things were to be found. But there we shall not meet, said the king's son, nodding at the same time to the poor boy who went into the darkest, thickest part of the wood. Where thorns tore his humble dress and scratched his face and hands and feet till they bled. The king's son got some scratches too, but the sun shone on his path, and it is him that we will follow, for he was an excellent and resolute youth. I must and will find the bell, said he. Even if I am obliged to go to the end of the world. The ugly apes sat upon the trees and grinned. Shall we thrash him? said they. Shall we thrash him? He is the son of king. But on he went without being disheartened, deeper and deeper into the wood. Where the most wonderful flowers were growing. There stood white lilies with blood red stamina, sky blue tulips, which shone as they waved in the winds, and apple trees, the apples of which looked exactly like large soap bubbles. So only think how the trees must have sparkled in the sunshine around the nicest. Green meads, where the deer were playing in the grass, grew magnificent ox and breeches. And if the bark of one of the trees was cracked, their grass and long creeping plants grew in the clivice. And there were large, calm lakes there too, in which wise winds were swimming. And beat the air with their wings. The king's son often stood still and listened. He thought the bell sounded from the depths of these still lakes. But then he remarked again that the tone proceeded not from there, but farther off, from out the depths of the forest. The sun now set. The atmosphere glowed like fire. It was still in the woods, so very still, and he fell on his knees, sung his evening hymn, and said, "I cannot find what I seek. The sun is going down, and night is coming, the dark, the dark night. Yet perhaps I may be able once more to see the round red sun before he entirely disappears." I will climb up yonder rock, and he seized hold of the creeping plants, and the roots of trees climbed up the moist stones where the water snakes were writhing, and the toads were clucking 
and he gained the summit before the sun had quite gone down. How magnificent was the sight from this height! The sea, the great, the glorious sea, that dashed its long waves against the coast was stretched out before him, and yonder, where sea and sky meet, stood the sun like a large, shining altar, all melted together in the most glowing colors, and the wood and the sea sang a song of rejoicing, and his heart sang with the rest. All nature was a vast holy church, and with the trees and the beyond clouds were the pillars, flowers and grass, the velvet carpeting, and heaven itself the large cupola. The red colors above faded away as the sun vanished, but a million stars were lighted, a million lamps shone, and the king's son spread out his arms towards heaven, and wood, and sea, when at the same moment, coming by a path to the right, appeared in his wooden shoes and jacket the poor boy who had been confirmed with him. He had followed his own path and had reached the spot just as soon as the son of the king had done. They ran towards each other and stood together hand in hand in the vast church of nature and of poetry, while over them sounded the invisible holy bell blessed spirits floated around them and lifted up their voices in a rejoicing hallelujah.